Good morning, everyone. And I want to thank um, Bill and Melinda Gates for continuing to give us this opportunity to be seen, to be felt, and to be heard. And that's really what this is about. That song that you just heard was from Jimmy Cliff. And it said simply, you can get it if you really want, but you must try and try and try. You'll succeed at last. I want us to change the word you to we. Because if we do it, we can make that difference. And why? Every generation before us has seen the challenges and has resolved that they need to step up to them. Four years ago, when I first came to New York as Prime Minister to speak at UNGA, I said that the world regrettably looked too much like it did 100 years ago. I didn't know then that we were going to see the Spanish flu again in the form of the pandemic. I didn't know then that we would see war in Europe again. I didn't know then that we would continue to have an imperialistic outlook to both finance and institutional reform globally. And we have now reached a point where we cannot take it anymore and where people are suffering, people are dying as a result of our failure to act. Our voices need to rise up. And I'm not just talking about the global voices of the South, I'm talking about people everywhere. If in 1969, when it was clear to the world that they could no longer rely only on gold or the US dollar as an international reserve asset in the IMF, the countries of the world came together and they created something called a special drawing right, which is simply just leveraging on the strength of the larger, stronger economies to be able to ensure that you could access this special foreign reserve asset that you could borrow against if needed. Problem is that they not only created it, but they created it in a way that once you issue it, everybody gets it. But if everybody gets it, and the strong are getting it, and the weak are still getting the microcosm of it, then we really haven't solved the problem. And what the world needs now is an amendment to the Articles of Association of the IMF that will allow us to, in a very strategic way, say, look, while we leverage the strength of the strong, we need to give it to the majority who actually need it. And for that to happen, we need to have, therefore, an amendment that says, let us focus on the vulnerable or those who actually need it. For that to happen, we need the United States government to agree. For that to happen, we need Congress to agree. For that to happen, we need the United States to recognize that as it holds 17% of the vote in the IMF, in order for the IMF to reach the 85% threshold, the US have to agree. Now, I'm not a surgeon, my foreign minister is. <laughs> but I learned from him that if you're gonna save lives, you have gotta be strategic, and you have gotta do the surgery where it matters. I want us here today to leave here, I'm not come to do a lot of long talk, to leave here today resolved to start a campaign to get the Congress of the United States of America to understand that they don't only now represent the 300 million people in this country, but their actions will have an impact now on billions of people. There are about 46 countries globally that are on the verge of a debt crisis. If that debt crisis really mushrooms, if those countries cannot pay their debt because interest rates have been rising this year, oil in Barbados, we've spent two and a half times for the first eight months of the year what we normally spend on oil. And we don't have the buffer or the room to do it. Luckily for us, we engaged in our debt restructuring and it finished in December 2019. When I became prime minister, our country was the third most indebted country per capita in the world, 177%. And we brought it down in a debt restructuring to 116%. And the month after we completed the debt restructuring, the pandemic came and the tourists stopped coming. And all of a sudden, what was a pathway to progress became a nightmare because of the absence of the major economic activity, not just for tourism, but it meant farmers weren't being able to sell their produce. It meant truckers weren't being able to get work because there was no produce to deliver. It meant everyone started to be affected. 
And it wasn't only Barbados. Every tourism and travel dependent country in the world had double digit declines in 2020. We called then for long term capital in order to be able to replace and to refinance the debt that we did with COVID. Nobody's heard us. We are seeing and seeing now the combined impact of climate, of COVID, and regrettably now of the war in Ukraine. In order for us to get away from that, we need to secure long-term funding. If we're gonna get the SDGs going, we need to be able to have funding that is 30-year funding. And I'll leave you with these two points, and I'll repeat it later again this week because I learned that politics is the art of repetition. <laughs> Believe you me. One, when the United Kingdom fought World War I, it issued its first bond in 1914, and then its second bond in 1917 to finance the war. By 1932, it realized that it could no longer service its debt that it had incurred in fighting the war while buying, borrowing money to rebuild after the war. And it issued bonds, consolidated those into a set of bonds in 1932. Do you know when they repaid that debt? Anyone? 2014, eight years ago. Similarly, when Germany lost the war, the developed countries agreed that Germany's debt service would be capped at 5% of their exports. Now, if it was good enough for the United Kingdom and it was good enough for Germany, then the 46 countries are so that are on the precipice of a debt crisis ought to have their voices heard. And I don't say so in anger. I say so as a cry of conscience. And I trust and pray that even if the governments don't want to hear us, that the people of the North and the people of the South shall for once rise in unison and make these goals our, our reality. If we don't do it, we are not going to see progress on the SDGs. And the SDGs are simply our right to live and our right to have an easy life on this earth. And I want to thank the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for continuing to be the goalkeepers and for also allowing us, therefore, to get messages outside of the structures of formal governments, because this now must be the global movement of our time. Thank you, and God bless. <laughs>